welcome to Education Today. I'm Jonathan Zisch, School and Community Relations Coordinator for the Armstrong School District. First, I'd like to thank everybody at WIEP-TV for airing this broadcast. Well, prom and graduation seasons are almost upon us, and we're going to take a grim look at what can go wrong when drinking and driving get into the mix. Our guest today is Bob Bauer, who is the longtime Armstrong County Coroner. Bob, thank you for being on the program. Thank you, John. Would you please tell us a little bit about your position and how it relates to prom and graduation seasons? Well, it's county coroner, Armstrong County. I investigate uh, all sudden, unexpected deaths. And uh, the type of deaths vary, but in this particular case, why we're here today, we're talking about drinking and driving and how does it uh, relate to prom. It's always been known through the years that uh, during prom week, nationally, we have alcohol-related deaths. Uh, I was asked to put a program together back in 1987 to be able to go to the schools and tell them why not to drink and drive, and we do it during prom week. During prom week, there is a number of events that the uh, school students put together, such as the Grim Reaper, and uh, during that week, I ended on Thursday before the prom, uh, a program on not drinking and driving. Mm. Yep. And I've, I have untitled it uh, through the years as the unheard consequences of drinking and driving. The unheard consequences of drinking and driving. Okay. Now, before we start our discussion, we have a visual overview of what can go terribly wrong if people drink and drive. It's a mock drunken driving accident that was staged at Catanic Senior High School. So let's take a look at that. Hi, yes, I'd like to report an accident. Um, I'm on the way to my prom, and there a car was hit. At Catanning High School, 204 Avenue, there's people outside of a car, they're hurt, there's blood everywhere. Okay, 1200 Ward Avenue. Two. They look all dead, I don't know. Looks like, well there's a pedestrian on a bike, so probably it looks like around 10, I'm not sure. My name's Janelle Lash. Lash. Six six four. Six three four four. Yes. Exactly. Please hurry. Okay. Okay. Thank you.
That footage really brought home the dangers of drinking and driving. Bob, I understand you've done annual high school assemblies on this topic since 1987. Would you please just give us a brief overview and take us step by step through this assembly, starting with the mock accident? Well, as you saw in the mock accident, John, the, uh, uh, the, what developed the accident is from the time the accident occurred, uh, where we had uh, four students out from prom night drinking and driving, uh, then an accident occurred where they collided with the second vehicle. The second vehicle, as you saw, had two adults in it. In this particular accident, there were two deaths and four injuries. You saw the ambulance and the emergency medical services pulling in along with the fire department, the state and local police, and, and the coroner. And we went through the accident just like it would normally occur, where people stand around and watch the accident. Uh, and people are very intrigued with death, and this is why people will stand around and watch the accident. They want to know what occurs. There's one thing you can't experience in life, and that's death. So therefore, until the bodies are removed, people will stay around and watch the accident. Uh, once the accident is cleared up, the bodies are removed and are taken to the hospital. And this is the essence of the program, uh, the unheard consequences. What you don't see and what you don't hear is behind the scenes. These programs were designed uh, through the years as, as, uh, as they've transpired is to take to the students a very, very serious message. Do not drink and drive. And, and I'd like to caution the, the audience, and my audience is the juniors and seniors at the uh, school assemblies. I caution them. I am not here to tell you not to drink. Whether or not the student drinks years to come is their own decision. We have, uh, I tell them, your seniors going out there into, uh, into the world after high school, you're going to be uh, going to the military, you're going to serve your country, some of you might uh, want to go to college and further your education, some are going to technical schools. This program is not about whether or not you should drink. That's your decision. What I'm here to tell you is do not drink and drive. That's your decision. I deal with death. I deal with death 24 hours a day. Job of coroner is deal with people that die naturally and unnaturally. Unnaturally would be suicide, homicide, and accidental, and in some cases undetermined death. When I deal with people who die naturally at home, I tell them I deal with people that uh, families say they're, they're going to their Heavenly Father, they're going to the land of plenty, uh, they're meeting their maker. But I'm a little bit more terse when I talk about accidental death. Accidental death when drinking and driving is preventable death, deaths that didn't have to occur. In that case, I deal with dead people, not people that simply have died and gone to see their maker. I deal with the greatest crime against humanity, and that's taking of one's life by another, and then identify that person and forward that information to the district attorney's office. This accident reenactment shows the fire department, shows the emergency medical services, shows the police. But what it really doesn't demonstrate, there's an element missing, and that element is there's a telltale smell that tells me at the scene whether or not alcohol was involved. As you noticed in the film, emergency medical services, the fire department, the rescue, coming in to, and, and especially the paramedics, I give them a lot of credit. They're the first ones on the police and fire that see the, the results of deadly accidents. But the emergency medical services are going in and they're going to do rescue. They're going to treat the patients before they even get them out of the vehicle. We've noticed over the past 15 years with the increase in emergency medical services and paramedics who are the eyes of the doctors, if we can treat them at the scene, treat them in the vehicle before they're removed, their recovery is much quicker and there's less likely chances of death. So they're treated within the vehicle and the bodies, as I come on scene, the bodies can stay where they are. It's more important to get the living out and treat their injuries. You also notice that uh, the field sobriety test, although not greatly demonstrated on this particular tape, the police will take the driver from the vehicle and take him to the side and do a field sobriety test. If there's evidence to show that the driver has been drinking, that person is given their rights and taken away. And they'll be persecuted at a later date should we find out that alcohol was in their system. 
And I can tell you, John, that when an arrest is made at the scene for the presumptive of drinking and driving, drinking and driving probably did occur. Mm. Have to remember in emergency medical service that injuries are life-threatening at times, depending on the extent of the accident. And uh, a lot of times we have to call Life Light in to take those people to a university hospital in Pittsburgh. When you have injuries greater than 35 mile an hour, we don't measure them in pounds per square inch, we measure them in tons per square foot. Therefore, the injuries are generally severe. Wow. But the unheard, the unseen part of the coroner is to give the death notification, investigate the death, and then be able to take the death message to the family. As driver of a vehicle, that was involved in an alcohol-related accident. I have to ask the driver, what will you do if you're involved in an accident and death occurred? I have to ask the students at the assembly, if you were the coroner and you were in my shoes, how would you take the death message to the family and let them know their loved one has died as a result of the accident, alcohol involved? And while I tell you a little bit more about the unseen consequences, Think about what you would do if you had to take the message to the family. And in a few minutes, I'll come back to that and I'll tell you what I do. But before the death notification, I have to be able to identify the individuals who die in the accident. And teenagers don't generally carry identification. So therefore, it takes a little longer to be able to investigate, to go back and interview people and try to find out who the, uh, and to identify the bodies. Many times, once the bodies are removed, I take them to the hospital morgue, where we do identification. And of course, as a coroner, I have to make a determination of the cause and manner of death. During the mock accident, you saw where we put the bodies in body bags. What are body bags? Body bags are simply a bag that is used to be able to secure a body until we get them to the hospital, identify them, determine the cause and manner of death, and be able to release them to a funeral director. The body bags, which I do not demonstrate at this particular program, but we do identify them during the assemblies. Body bags, six foot long. They're $65 a piece. They're triple stitched. They take weight up to $400. Non-permeable zipper that doesn't allow fluids to leak out. Today's day and age, we worry about communal disease. I'd let the students know that these bags are purchased through tax dollars. Tax dollars of your mom and dad's, of your teachers, of myself. And if any one of you students out there work and they take taxes out of your paycheck, you're also paying for body bags used at death-related scenes. We take them to the hospital morgue, we sometimes have to do an autopsy an autopsy, also known as a necropsy study. We have to determine exactly why the death occurred, not only to know and be able to take that to family, but also there's going to be a court hearing later to determine if that person drinking and driving was the cause of the accident, and if they are, they'd be prosecuted and probably serve a jail sentence. So therefore, the courts want to know exactly what the cause of death was. The autopsy, a complete internal and external exam. We have to determine if blood was involved, or alcohol, I'm sorry, if alcohol was involved. So therefore, I have to do a blood alcohol exam. I demonstrate, and again, not at this particular program, but during the assembly, I show them the needle that I use. It's a six inch needle with a 16 gauge bore, which means I can look into one end of the needle, look out the other, and see each one of the students individually through the end of that needle. I insert that needle into the chest, into the heart, where I take blood and have the blood tested for alcohol. But many times during an accident, when you have impact the steering wheel or the pavement or another part of the car, we don't have blood, blood available. So therefore, we go to the bladder. I insert the needle into the lower part of the abdomen into the bladder and remove the urine, where I can do an alcohol exam. It's not unusual during death that people become incontinent and they lose the, the contents of their bladder. I have to go to another part of the body. I use the eye. With a shorter needle, I take vitreous. 
from the eye. And from the eye fluid, I can do an alcohol exam. I tell the students many at different times, a car will engulf in flame, and the bodies are burnt beyond recognition. So therefore, I don't have the eyes available. I also have the bile from the gallbladder that I can use for an alcohol exam. Hidden neatly underneath the liver, it's a good insulator, so therefore bile is always available. And my point is, John, that if alcohol is part of that scene, we're going to be know it. There's no way we can hide alcohol content at a scene. If the driver is survivable, then we'll take them to the hospital and they'll have a blood exam done also. Let's come back now to what you would do if you were a coroner and you had to go to the scene and then go to the house and notify the family that their loved one, their son, their daughter died of injuries in an auto accident. I am met with all kinds of reactions from families as I knock at the door at 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night, 1, 2 in the morning. Family comes down, answers the door, and all they see is myself, suit and tie, and a lot of times I'll take a policeman with me. So you'll see someone in uniform, or they'll see a neighbor, or they'll see a policeman or a minister who I have through the investigation uh, had called to come to give, help me give the death notification. The family knows right all of, a, all of a sudden there's a problem. I introduce myself. My name is Bob Bauer. I'm the Armstrong County Coroner. I'm sorry I have to tell you, but your son, your daughter, died as a result of an accident tonight. John, I can't begin to tell you the number of reactions I get from families. Wailing, crying, screaming. They lost someone, the love of their life, as a result of a needless death, an accidental death as a result of drinking and driving. It's unimaginable. I have families that just stand there that cannot grasp the fact that uh, what the information I just gave them. I have families that grab onto me and just hold me. I have them sit down. Many times they'll go up to the mantle, they'll take a picture off the wall, a picture off the mantle, a picture off the dresser, and they hold and hug them. And it can't help to bring a tear to your eye if they know they lost one, someone so near and dear to them. and it's something you have to be able to experience and see to realize the impact of the family. But moving on, once I give the death notification, I tell the students, what are you going to do now? You find yourself, you're involved in a drinking and driving accident, you're the driver. You're now in police custody. Are you going to sit there at the police station and cry and say, I'm sorry? Well, it's too late to be sorry. You already did it. I wish I had to do it all over again. If it's too late, you already did it. I wish my mom and dad were here. What for? You already did it. You want your mom and dad there to hold your hand? They should have been holding your hand before you left that evening, before you got in the car and you drank and then drove, then had an accident. It's too late. You already did it. I want to tell you about some new friends you're going to meet. If you're found guilty of drinking and driving, and from the beginning when you're taken away by the police, you're going to be taken to the police station, you're going to be interviewed, you've met the, the policeman. If there's reason to believe you're drinking and driving, you're going to be taken to a magistrate to be arrived, you're going to meet the magistrate. Your mom and dad are going to want to bail you out of jail. You're going to meet a bail bondsman because they don't want you to be in jail. Later you're going to go to court to be arraigned officially. You're going to meet the district justice. He's going to hold you over in jail until you're bonded out again. You're going to meet the guards at the jail. You're going to go to court later. You're going to meet some new friends. You're going to meet the court reporter. You're going to meet the judge. You're going to meet the district attorney. If you're found guilty of drinking and driving, you'll spend some time in jail. And it's a minimum of five years, drinking and driving. You go to jail, you're not going to go to the Armstrong County Jail, which only holds uh, crimes up to two years. You're going to have to go to somewhere into a state prison system where you're going to meet new friends. You're going to meet a jail warden, new guards. You're going to meet other people in jail for incest, theft, burglary, rape, murder. Is that the quality of life you wanted for yourself? 
Is that the quality of life you want it for your family, for your mom and dad, or for your brothers and sisters? I would think not. Somewhere along the line, you're going to get out of jail. You're going to go back home. And you're going to see the friends. The question is, are they still your friends? When you walk up to a group that you might have graduated with and they're talking, all of a sudden they quit talking. Who do you think they were talking about? Do you feel that you're still part of the group? Do you feel they can still go to the neighbors and share in a movie or in the backyard pool? Are you going to be able to share memories like the other kids? Is that the quality of life you wanted for yourself? Is that the quality of life you wanted for your mom and dad? I tell the students about a silver medalist. It's been years ago, John, but I still remember it well. The silver medalist won the diving championship at the Olympics. Fortune and fame. He was making lots of money. He was in front of the Cheerio box. He was in the news magazines. He was in the sports magazines. He was on TV. Bought himself a new car. Life was made, making plenty of money. Went and bought a sports car. Down in Florida, drinking and driving one evening, he ran through a group of 13 kids, teenagers. Killed two of them. He was found guilty, went to jail, was sentenced for 25 years. He was out in 13 with 20 years probation. When he came out of jail, he had not 10 cents to his name. He had to bore his mother's car to go around. Is that the kind of quality of life you want for yourself? Is that the quality of life you wanted for your mom and dad or your brothers and sisters? I would think not. Drinking age, state of Pennsylvania, is 21. And believe me, there's many 21-year-old out there that cannot handle alcohol and drink and drive. The same I can say for 25, 30, 40, and 50-year-olds. Drinking age, state of Pennsylvania, is not 16, 17, 18, 19, or 20. It's 21. A number of years ago, there was a broadcast, a radio broadcast, that actually really set me back. It was the university hospitals are looking for, forward to May and June proms for organ procurement. What they knew then was during prom week, the kids went out, drank, and drove. And doing so, there was accidental death. Teenagers' organs are great for body procurement for, to uh, donate organs. When implanted in children, they atrophy or get smaller and meet the needs of the child. Or for adult, they actually, what we call, fit perfectly. It was only after a year that that program was taken off the market, that plea. And hospitals, university hospitals, looking forward to May and June prom nights. But it really sent a message that they know during prom week, kids drink and drive. Good news. Nationally, and in the state of Pennsylvania, we have not taken away the drinking driver, but we certainly have increased our odds. We have a much, much less uh, drinking and driving, uh, not only on, on teenagers, but also the ones 20, 30, 40, and 50. And I think it's because of the uh, stern laws and the tough laws we have. It's about our district attorney, not in, only in Armstrong County, but across the state, who implement the law and the judges are sending the drinking driver to jail. You can play the odds. Certainly, we know kids go out there, drink and drive, and they play their odds. Someday, I will see you, but you will not see me. But are you do and are the survivor of an accident. You will see me. You will see the district attorney, you will see the police, you will see the judge, and you will see jail. Please, I appeal to you. Kids, teenagers, adults, do not drink and drive. The quality of, you li the quality of life that you want is in your hands. John, that is the essence of the assembly that we do annually for the schools in Armstrong County. That's a stirring program. I had no words while you were speaking. Well, you know. the, the program, and I, I, and I get many comments over the years that uh, 
it's one of the programs that, and my credit goes to the, to the assembly, to the teenagers, to the juniors and seniors that listen to this program. From the time I began, and again, people are intrigued with death, and I talk a lot about death. From the time I give the program to the time I empty, there's not a word being said. They listen intently. And I think because of the intense listening that would have been very successful in Armstrong County, a taking away the drinking and driving of our teenagers in the high school setting. Well, Bob, I want to thank you for sharing this important message. Uh, stern as it was, we needed to hear it. We need to be reminded of it. Well, I thank you very much for the yeah, opportunity. I appreciate this. For coming in and being able Definitely. to talk about the program. I think it's pretty clear. Don't drink and drive this prom and graduation season or ever. Um, that's our show for today. I would like to thank Barb Keller, who teaches television production classes at Ford City Junior Senior High School. Her students did a great job as today's film crew. Please join us again next week for Education Today, looking at the Armstrong School District and its initiatives. Until next time, please have a safe and enjoyable week. The sixth annual visit of the safety bug at Fort City High School is scheduled for May 31st. It will happen between 8 a.m. and 2 p.m. and the location is between 10th Street and 11th Street right along 3rd Avenue in Fort City. Anyone from the community is welcome to drive the safety bug but they must have a valid driver's license and make an appointment by calling the school at 724-763-5289. They can also email the teacher in charge Mrs. Gladyszewski Klukin at KLUS at ASD.K12.PA.US.